Yes. Good morning. How y'all doing? Oh, come on. How you doing? That's what I thought. Y'all stand your feet. We're going to take you on a little ride uh, through the progression of jazz, starting with bluegrass, moving on to Dixieland, and then finally to, to swing. Let's worship the Lord together. for a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for allowing us into your presence, for taking us, Father, from this world and all of its cares and all of its troubles and all of its questions and all of its responsibilities and bringing us into the eternal world where we sit with Christ on high, where we experience your fellowship, where we experience your glory where we see and know what real is, what eternal is. And Father, how we pray that you would teach us day by day, week by week, year by year, to enter that eternal place and to draw from it all that we need to do your kingdom's work in this finite place. May our worship this day renew, restore, recharge, and prepare us to serve you to the utmost of our abilities. In the precious and the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Before you sit down, turn and shake a hand or two and just welcome somebody to this time of worship.
thank you so very much. Please have a seat. We do welcome you to this time of worship and praise on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and here we are all breathless as we come to the end of a year. It's not simply the end of a semester, it's the end of an academic year fast approaching, a graduation for some fast approaching, the end of a first year for others, a middle year for some, and who knows what for everyone, but always, in every case, everybody's feeling the pressure and feeling the weight of the end of a year drawing nigh. What a great time to enter into the presence of God. If you see a wave, grab a surfboard. That's a lesson that every pastor needs to know. Every community has its distinctive characteristics, have its rhythms, has its things that go on that draw people to something. In New Orleans, Jazz and Heritage Festival is one of the biggest events of the year. People come from literally all over the world to be here right now. They're getting off of planes at the New Orleans airport with carrying their folding chairs and all kinds of stuff to go to Jazz Fest. So it's a great opportunity for us to take this medium of music and to use it to worship and praise Jesus, have a connecting point with our community, and we are excited about this being Jesus and all that Jazz Week in chapel. There are two different skill sets that Southern Baptist ministers need to understand because God is going to call you to use one skill set or the other or perhaps some combination of both. Those two skill sets are how to start a church from scratch and how to revitalize an existing church. If you do not know at least one of those skill sets, then you're going to have some great challenges in ministry for these are the two greatest opportunities that Southern Baptists have. Many, many places that do not have a church and need a church or churches. Often it will require a bivocational skill set to work, earning a living one way and serving Jesus uh, on a weekend through starting a new church in another way. That's not just something for the reaches of the country outside the historic territory of the Southern Baptist Convention. That's in the heart of the Southern Baptist Convention, places like Mississippi and Alabama uh, and Georgia. Almost 50% of their ministers are bivocational ministers in one way or another. And starting a church from scratch is something we need to know how to do but also revitalizing an existing church. We have an enormous Great Commission resource that is sitting on the shelf, and that is church after church after church after church in Southern Baptist life who is looking back on their greatest days. Every record they've ever had, every great accomplishment they've ever had, every moment of terrific excitement, it's all in their past. And they're looking for a way to learn how to grow again. And that skill set for revitalizing churches is one of the most complicated challenges facing Southern Baptists today. So we're adding a course to our curriculum on revitalizing churches to help our students begin to get some handles. And today we're very honored to have with us as our pastor for the day, someone who is doing just exactly that. Michael Carney is the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church on the West Bank. And if you have never visited that church, it's a good church for you to visit. Who knows what God might teach you there, might even lead you to be a member there. I always like to ask our local pastors to come and tell us where you are. So come on up here and join me and tell us where in the world is Calvary Baptist Church? Dr. Kelly, thank you. It's an honor to be here today. And Calvary Baptist Church, the way I like to tell people is go to the Superdome and then go across the big bridge and we're at the bottom of the big bridge right there over the river. And uh, it has been a wonderful journey, quite a challenge, but it is a revitalization story that um, I'm very proud of what the Lord's done there. I, I think it's a great model for all young ministers, older ministers, people looking for hope in churches that have existed for a long time but actually can fulfill their potential for the Great Commission. So I'm very excited about it. So how many people were there on your first Sunday at Calvary? 217. I remember that. And how many people were there on Easter Sunday? Easter Sunday, we for the Easter weekend, we averaged uh, just under 1,000 people for the Easter weekend. Good Friday services and two services on Sunday. Um, the second service was slammed, so we're looking at now growing into two services. Pretty exciting. To quote an ancient Hebrew expression, wow, that is a wonderful, wonderful story for which we are very grateful. Now, what time are your services? 10.30 right now, and then in the fall we'll hope to launch too. So 10.30 to begin with, and we'd like to pack the place out. So if you're looking for a church home, 
feel free to come by. Very good. Now, how many years as a senior pastor did you have before you came to Calvary? None. <laughs> None. All right, students, are you listening? Many of our greatest churches in the convention, anybody ever heard of First Baptist Church Woodstock with Brother Johnny Hunt? Who ever heard of First Baptist Woodstock before Johnny Hunt went there? Nobody. Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, Pastor Fred Luter, he's about to be overwhelmingly elected as president of Southern Baptist Convention, largest Baptist church in Louisiana. Who ever heard of Franklin Avenue Baptist Church before Fred Luter went there with a commission from the association to bury it or resurrect it? There are great opportunities out there. Mm -hmm. And this is a younger pastor who saw not all the terrible stories people tell about going to a traditional church who saw the opportunity for God to do a work. He was serving on the church staff of First Baptist Atlanta with Dr. Charles Stanley. He was serving as student minister uh, in that church, also teaching pastor at another church. Saw what Katrina did to New Orleans, and again, saw not the devastation. He saw the opportunity to come and do something fresh and new for the Lord, and God is blessing. Who knows what God will do with your life if you just see not trouble, but you see an opportunity. Thank you so much for being with us, Thank Brother you. Michael. We'll look forward to hearing a word from you in just a bit. His wife, Melissa, is here right over here. Melissa, welcome. Thank you so much for being a part of our worship service today. And now let's turn our hearts towards worship. Let's stand together again, and we're going to sing Crown Him with Many Crowns. Him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, those wounds and visible above in beauty glorified. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, standing in the love of God, I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. 
all the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Ooh, Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing, standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God I'm standing on the promises of God I'm standing on the promises of God Good morning. I am very grateful that you actually showed up for chapel today. I mean, it's a beautiful day outside. French uh, Jazz Fest does start. You could have been down there, but you probably have class, right? You're not going to skip class. You're going you're gonna to make sure you're here today. I mean, you could have been doing anything, but I am very, very grateful and humbled by the opportunity, Dr. Kelly and, and Miss Kelly, Dr. Kelly as well. Thank you very much for having us. Good to see uh, so many friends and people that have influenced my life and are continuing to influence my life. Very grateful for it. Dr. Tolbert, good to see you today. Um, just an honor to be here, as well as I saw Dr. Warren earlier. Um, Dr. Warren, for those of you who struggle through your Greek season of life, it's worth it. Um, in honor of him, I actually did translate the one verse that I'm going to preach from today, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, very grateful for his influence over my life. Dr. Warren actually was a catalyst in, in allowing my wife and I and our children to move back to New Orleans from Atlanta, so I'm actually very grateful for him. He saw the opportunity as well for God to do something special in New Orleans post-Katrina, and, and life is defined by Katrina for so many people in New Orleans. They have stories, they have hurts, and they can live there in the past, or we as God's people can look at the obstacles and turn them into opportunities. And one of the things that Melissa and I, as we prayed about returning to New Orleans, which I did my schooling here, but didn't think that I would come and serve in the city. When we prayed about that, we saw an opportunity. We saw an opportunity to bring life into a culture, and, and what a spectacular culture it is. Um, I mean, this week, as Dr. Kelly has said, you know, we have Jazz Fest, and I was kind of hoping that he'd have the Zach Brown Band here for chapel today. Um, I told Melissa, I said, you know, if there's one group that I'd love to see this weekend, it'd be the Zach Brown Band. I have a brother that um, plays guitar like Slash, and he plays for a band um, in Texas, and they actually uh, do some of Zach Brown's songs, so I've become familiar with that. Not that I listen to secular music or anything, right? Um, you know, culture is all redeemable by Jesus Christ. Culture is all redeemable by Jesus Christ, and we are in a city that is rich in culture and rich in opportunity. You are not here by accident. Let me say that again. You are not here by accident. Whether you're a professor investing in the lives of the future generation of leaders, ministry leaders in America, or as a student, whether young or older, you didn't come to New Orleans by accident. God is not a God of accidents. He didn't create you by accident. He didn't place you by accident. He didn't gift you by accident. And you're here in New Orleans for a reason. You know, NAM has labeled New Orleans a strategic focus city. They're a little bit behind the curve on that. I mean, we all knew that it was a strategic focus city, right? Before they ever put a label on it. I mean, it truly is. Our culture is rich. The people are wonderful. The food is fantastic. Can I get an amen on that? And there are many, many people in this city to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the story of Calvary um, is a great story. Uh, we're just watching the Lord um, unfold his vision for the city of New Orleans through one local church. And we're praying for his will beyond that. So it's pretty exciting to see what he's doing. Um, it is not an easy journey. I'm going to tell you some things today that I think will help you as a student. So if you, if you have a notepad or if you have your iPhone or your iPad or anything that you can write some things down, I'm going to give you a few things today to really talk about what it means to make a difference, what it means to reap a harvest 
in revitalization. I know that you heard from a church planner on Tuesday, and, and what a fine young man to learn from. Um, there's some great church planners in this city, and, and yet God's specific calling in my life is revitalization, and that's also equally important, and I'd like to share that with you. Um, before I do, we're going we're gonna, to um, look from the book of 2 Timothy today, 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to look at the scripture. But before we read the scripture, I was having a conversation with some of our staff about this weekend and, and, and me preaching today. And I'm, I'm very glad that they're here, here today. Some of the staff, some of the interns that are helping accomplish the Great Commission at Calvary. Very grateful to see you. I know that they all came because they wanted their paycheck this weekend. But I'm very grateful you're here nonetheless. And it's a very good good time to see you. We were talking about... The zombies that are kind of going to be wandering around the city this weekend because with the jazz fest, you know, people are going to indulge in certain behaviors and they're going to, they're going to walk around like zombies. And I don't know what the fascination with zombies is. I mean, there's a video game, you know, that actually has New Orleans as its backdrop for fighting zombies. And then one of my staff members, I'm not going to rat him out by name, but um, Pastor Rick, he was talking to me this morning and, and he said, you know, and it's so awesome that you're going to speak in the chapel at New Orleans. You know what that place is really good for? And I said, what? And I, he said, well, obviously, naturally, preaching the gospel and, and having good music. But he said, I could just envision that place as a zombie hunting paradise, you know, <laughs> tucking behind the pews, behind the columns, up in the balcony, you know. I don't know what the fascination with zombies is. But the reality is many people in our world, they really walk around as zombies, they walk around without a purpose. They walk around without a vision. They walk around without insight into what God's created for them to become, what he has for them, what he has in store for them. Many people have no clue, no purpose. They're walking around like zombies, and, and we're here in New Orleans to help remedy that. We have the antivirus, the vaccination, the word of Christ that changes lives and brings people out of zombiehood into life. And we're going to talk about that today because some of you will leave this place once you graduate and you will go to an established existing church. And that church has not seen growth in years. They're living with patterns and programs that they've prioritized above people and they've placed above the purpose of God and they're just locked in this zombie mode of life. And you and I have been called and equipped and gifted by God to lead a charge into making sure that the bride of Jesus Christ shines brighter than ever before in these final days until the sun returns. And you've been gifted and called and you're being equipped through this seminary to do that. Now naturally your professors and your time here cannot teach you everything. But today, I'd like to be able to share and add a little bit to what they've been equipping you and investing into you and what some of you as leaders are doing right now for your students. Some things to consider in how to help reap a harvest in this generation, a harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. And I'd like to start before we look at the passage by telling you a story about my childhood. I, I look back on childhood and there's some things that really stand out. I can remember as a child, my grandparents, my father's parents grew up in Alabama, in rural Alabama, in, a, in the middle of nowhere in a little town called Toxie. I mean, you can't even find it on a map. They literally were the town that had one stoplight. And it wasn't a red, yellow, green stoplight. It was a flashing yellow stoplight. So nobody really ever stopped in Toxie. But I can remember that my father, when he would take my brothers and I to visit our grandparents in the country, one of their prides and joys of life was their garden. Now, I'm not talking about a small garden like in the backyard, a couple of little tomato plants. My grandfather had a three-acre garden, a three-acre garden. That is like three times this chapel that we're in today. And in that garden, he would plant in the red clay soil of that part of Alabama, not necessarily fertile soil, mind you, not the best rich soil of the river bottoms where the nutrients fertilize the soil naturally, not in that area, but in this red clay soil of Alabama, in Toxie, Alabama, my grandfather would plant this garden. And this garden would bear a tremendous amount of fruit. I can remember I grew to love okra. I don't know why some people have this thing against okra. It's wonderful, especially if my grandmother cooked it for you. You would love it, you know, with all the lard and the Crisco and the, the ham hocks and all that stuff that's really healthy for you today. My grandmother would cook those things, those vegetables from her garden. 
But I can remember the plant that fascinated me the most in my grandfather's garden was the corn. Because the corn would start as this small little plant, but then by the end of the growing season, the corn was this towering plant above everything else in the garden. And there was a process that I didn't understand as a child that my grandfather went through to make sure that his corn would actually bear fruit. Very interesting process. Well, I didn't understand that until I became a teenager, and my dad thought it was a good idea that he plant a garden and that I learn how to plant a garden. Now, I realize that we are... You know, we are metro kind of people, urban people, and so we have no space in our concrete or in our dorm rooms or anything to plant a garden. But there's some lessons about farming that are very important because as my father began to teach me when he planted a garden, there are times when you have to get it done and there's no excuse. And I can remember the corn. For some reason, I can remember the planting of the corn. And my father, as he would plant the garden in our backyard, just a fraction of my grandfather's garden, but as he would plant that corn, I can remember there were certain seasons that I could not do what I wanted to do because my father would say the corn is ready to be harvested. And I can remember I loved to play basketball in high school homework. That was not important. Basketball was. It was my American idol. It was the thing that I loved to do. And so I pursued, you know, basketball. But there was this season of life in the late spring when school's getting ready to get out about this season of time where I would want to do anything but work in the garden. I'd want to do anything but pull weeds. And there was this one season of time a week where my father would say, you cannot go play basketball. You can't go fishing. You can't go out with the girls. You have to stay home and help me take the corn out of the garden because the corn is ready to be harvested. And I was like, Dad, can't we just wait till next week? You know, school will be out. You know, I'll schedule no dates. You know, we won't play basketball. Can't we just wait? You can't wait. You have to help me now. There was no excuse acceptable for not helping get the corn out when the corn was ready. Now, I know you're sitting here thinking, man, that has absolutely nothing to do with church revitalization. Well, I would have agreed with you back then until Melissa and I decided that we would invest in a small piece of agricultural ground in the Midwest. And that small piece of agricultural ground is actually being planted as we speak in, in corn. And I have a friend, a farmer, who leases this piece of ground that Melissa and I own for our future and for our posterity, for our children, just, just for fun, just to learn a little bit about farming. And I talked with Jamie Martin. He's, he's a good friend of mine now, and he's a farmer. And I said, Jamie, teach me a little bit about farming. Now, this is going somewhere, so I want you to hold tight for just a minute, okay? Because this is going to change your concept on your harvest in your life for the church that you will start or that you will revitalize or the mission place that you will serve or the place in which you will teach and educate generational leaders. This will revolutionize your life, I promise. So hold tight. When I asked Jamie about the farming process, naturally I know now that farming is not just about the harvest. And the reality is, sitting in this room today, you are bright-eyed. Many of you are looking toward the future, toward the investment as professors that you've made in students and what promises they will bring. That was my student who, who accomplished that at that church. And, and you're investing in missionaries that will change the world, who books will be written by and about. And so you're looking forward to the future, to a harvest of your investment in your time. But those of you who are training now and looking toward the future of your ministry and whatever role or capacity it will be, we're always looking ahead to the harvest. And we just expect that we're going to receive this huge harvest. I mean, that's what God called you for, right? I mean, God called you to be the next William Carey who is going to have things written about him or her. To call, he's called you to be the next person that starts a church and it ends up like Stephen Furtick or Andy Stanley or Charles Stanley if you're revitalizing a church. We just look and think that the harvest is automatic. But we know better. We know better when it comes to farming, right? And when I called Jamie, I said, Jamie, I want you to walk me through what it means to actually farm. And so as we were talking, I said, I want you to tell me a little bit, bit about it. And you realize that before you ever get to the harvest, there are 22 steps that you have to take? Dr. Kelly, there are 22 steps that you have to take behind the scenes that nobody ever sees, that ever, nobody ever knows about before you reap the harvest. 
So number one, you identify naturally a parcel of ground that you're going to farm. And you have to do that early in the summer, the summer before the crop is ready a year later. You have to identify the ground. Now, when you find that ground, as a farmer, and you go and identify that parcel, and I remember when Jamie called me, and Jamie said, hey, I realize that you have this track of ground. I realize nobody's farming it. Would you let me begin to plant corn on it? I said, well, sure. He's like, I'll pay you for it. I said, okay, be happy for you to do that. Yeah, and, uh, and he began to do that. Well, he identified his parcel a year before he would ever receive the crops. You got that? Then when he identified the parcel, just like my grandfather in southern Alabama would dig into the red clay soil, Jamie began to do pH test and fertilization test on the soil. What kind of soil is it? Well, in New Orleans, we work in a very rich soil, a soil that is ready to produce a harvest. It's always wise to look at the soil in which you're going to plant yourself to determine what kind of harvest you can receive. It's a wise step. But a farmer will take pH samples. He'll test the fertilizer. He'll find out, is this good soil or is this bad soil? And then in the fall, as he determines what kind of soil it is, he will then put in the phosphorus or the potassium or the lime or the potash to bring the pH of the soil to the level that he wants it to be for the crop that he's trying to reap. There's a lot of science that goes into it that you would never know behind the scenes. As a matter of fact, it was interesting as Jamie was telling me about the process. Did you realize that as a farmer there are different types of seeds that grow different types of corn? I mean, they have seeds that are Roundup ready. Now, what does Roundup ready mean? It means that when the crop begins to sprout and the green comes up, guess what comes up? And the Bible talks about this a lot. Guess what comes up with the good harvest? Weeds. But if your seed was so engineered in such a way that it is round up resistant then you can literally take these big booms across the field and when the the sprouts begin to come up of the crop you can spray roundup which is a weed killer go buy it at lowe's try it on your flowers see what happens and you spray it across the field and it kills everything but the crop he actually was telling me that there's a seed that when he determines the soil and he's ready to plant there's a seed that has a tri level of protection in it in other words, it protects against three different types of insects. And so already these plants have been bioengineered to resist certain types of chemicals, certain types of insects, blight, different destructive forces. Jamie says you do all of that in the fall before you ever plant the crop. And then once you've got the soil ready, you go on and till the ground in the fall because you allow the nutrients and all the stuff to go on and biodegrade into the soil, to put nutrients into the soil. It's a fascinating process. And you can all wake up right now because I'm almost done telling you this story. <laughs> then comes the spring. And in the spring, he will plant 35,000 seeds per acre. 35,000 seeds per acre. One little seed, 35,000 of them per acre and he'll drill them in the ground in rows a certain amount of part because a certain amount of part because the plants need X amount of space to grow and produce and so he has to do it just right there's a science to it and then as a farmer he will go back once or twice a week and he'll check it every day and those all day long in that he'll look for weeds he'll look for the plants he'll look for this he'll find out what he needs to spray to get it going and get it up to an established point and all of that happens through the entire summer, and then comes the harvest. And at the harvest time, everybody in the family gets involved in the harvest. All right, we're all God's family, right? Everybody in his family will get involved in the harvest. He'll get on the tractor. His son will get on the trailer. They will haul, and they'll go in, and they'll shell the grain. And they don't just automatically go in and shell the grain. Because before the grain comes out, they have to determine what percentage of moisture actually exists in the corn. And usually there is a date called maturity. And that maturity date is so many days of certain types of weather will produce a mature crop. And 35% moisture in there lets you know that the plant is at relative maturity. So many times in dealing with our churches, we're dealing with people who are at relative maturity. But what we have to get to in the crop for the corn is a 15% moisture ratio. More than 15%. And when you go to store the grain of the corn it will spoil in the bin 
and you lose everything as a farmer. You lose your livelihood. You lose the income. You lose the lease. You lose all the opportunities. If you go less than 15%, then the grain is no good. And when you take it to the elevator, it gets rejected because there's not enough moisture in it for it to be a sustainable product. But ultimately, when he gets it down to that point, after so many days of certain kinds of weather and monitoring, he harvests it. And when the harvest comes, when the harvest comes, you can't stop. You get up at daylight, you get the equipment, you get the family, and you go. And you come back home, and he says, sometimes 1 a.m. I mean, you're talking fanatic here. But what, what a great lesson for ministers. What a great lesson for us to learn from. And the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy, very simply to his young protege, his young student, his young pastor, as he's passing on to the next generation, leadership that will impact the church of Jesus Christ. He says to him in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. The hard-working farmer must be the first to receive his share of the crops. Now I want to submit to you today that there are certain characteristics that we need to sow in our lives if we're going to make a difference as church planners, if we're going to make a difference in revitalizing churches, if we're going to make a difference on the mission field, if we're going to make a difference as a support member to a team that is accomplishing the Great Commission. We have to sow certain character traits. And those character traits happen way before the harvest. So many times in our lifespan, we look at a harvest. We look at someone like an Andy Stanley, like a Mark Driscoll, we look at a Stephen Furtick in this generation, some of those young leaders, and we look and we hear the story about how they have these great churches in these areas that were unchurched, and we go, wow, I want to do that. I want to be like that. I want to be a part of that. God, you've called me to that. We hear stories of missionaries around the world, and we go, I want to be just like them. They've made a difference in feeding hungry children and leading them to Christ and starting orphanages. And that is our desire. That is our heart because we want to be a part of the harvest. That's what God's called us to. But before the harvest comes, you've got to farm. Before you can reach a harvest, you've got to sow in certain character traits and principles to allow you to reap the crop. And the crop naturally is souls and the lives of men and women, boys and girls. But there are some things that I would say that we can learn from the hardworking farmer as the Apostle Paul relates this to Timothy. Number one, if I were sowing character traits and describing church re revitalization and the story of Calvary currently, and I were teaching students or followers or interns or my staff, uh, and they can, they can verify this, number one, the Bible says that it is the hard-working farmer. So the first character trait that I would sow is a strong work ethic. A strong work ethic. We don't receive a harvest if we don't work for it. Now, why would I say that to a group of seminary students? Do you realize that as you go into a revitalization of a church or into a church plan or something like that, do you realize that people think you only work one day a week? <laughs> They really think that you stand up for 30 minutes or 45 if you're in my church, sometimes 50, and that you just fly off the cuff with that stuff. That's what they think. They just think that worship services come together. They just think that people naturally show up to your church because they want to. No, the people in New Orleans want to be at Jazz Fest all weekend. They don't want to be in church. But until we learn the lesson of the farmer that it is hard work in the ministry, we will not reap a harvest. There's actually a stigma, and I hate to share this with you, but there's actually a stigma that people go into the ministry and they go to seminary and they work in the church because they are lazy. That's true. That's actually what the world thinks about us. Now, some of you are going, yeah, I wish they knew the truth. I'm dying in this. I'm overwhelmed. I'm, I'm overworked. But it's also true that some people set a bad example for us in ministry and they, they do take churches and they go play golf during the week or play video games all the time and they're not focused on the mission of God's bride, the church, to reach the lost and reap a harvest. 
The reality is the hardworking farmer, as Paul was passing this on to Timothy, he was telling him to be hardworking. In the Greek, as you take that phrase hardworking, it means to be spent with labor, to toil, to be able to faint if necessary from weariness. So when Paul paints this picture for young Timothy, he's saying, will you labor for your mission for the ministry until you have labored to the point of fainting? My staff can tell you it was funny that one of the things that we do is we get there, we go to work, and we don't quit until we're finished. And there are events that we have in revitalizing a church that are all hands on deck events. And what I want them to understand is that you don't just go to church and it automatically happens. You don't automatically reap a harvest. And some of you are saying right now, what about the power of the Holy Spirit? What about God's call on my life? I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But I'm giving you principles to sow into your life. Your professors that are here today, Dr. Kelly and the leadership of the seminary, they work hard to make this a place that is adequate and relevant in a modern generation to equip you in the next generation. And it's all about reaping that harvest, but it begins with hard work. The reality of the hard work is this. If you put in a little work as a farmer, listen, you will reap a little harvest. Well, that's not so bad, is it? I mean, a little bit of work, a little bit of harvest, that's good. It's not so bad unless your livelihood depends upon it. For in the Greek, when you look at this passage as well, talking about the farmer, what you begin to understand about this individual that Paul is describing is his very life depends upon what he does. His very livelihood depends upon what he's doing. And if he doesn't work hard to receive a growing harvest, then he and his family could actually starve. Now, I realize as well that many of us will go into churches and you won't be paid what you think you're worth after seminary. Some of you right now are thinking, yeah, I'm going to the mission field and and my family and I, we very well may starve. But I want to give you the principle that Paul gave Timothy. The hard-working farmer is the one who will be the first to receive his reward of the crops. You sow the right principles, you will receive the right crop. You sow the right kind of work ethic, you will receive the right results. That is a great principle. I hope you wrote that one down because the reality of Calvary, though we can talk about the growth over Easter weekend and the multiplication of people, the salvation of souls. I even had one of our newly saved people. It was quite fun. I love this, Dr. Kelly. Newly saved people. I love newly saved people. One of our newly saved, born in New Orleans, West Bank people called me up the other day and said, Hey, Pastor, hey, what you doing this afternoon? Well, I'm just preparing for Sunday. Um, well, look, you know, Jazz Fest is going on down the quarter. I'd love to go down there with you and your wife. We can grab a couple of beers and just hang out and watch some concerts. I love that because the reality is that he has just freshly been saved and, and kind of ignorant of how to do church. And yet in revitalizing and working hard to create a church where he can fit, where he can become a disciple of Christ, there's room for him in the harvest. And we've seen that through hard work. The story is hard work, and not everybody likes that kind of story, but working hard at what God has called you to do will bring a harvest. Can I get an amen on that? The second principle that Paul shows from this passage, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. The second principle is to maintain clear focus and vision. Clear focus and vision. What is it that God has gifted you and called you to do? Then develop a clear focus and vision that God has given you for that. If God has gifted you to preach the gospel as a pastor of a local church or a church planter, then your clear focus and clear vision on that, to refine that gift, to work at that gift, will create in you a desire and an opportunity to become what you have been called to be. But if you're not gifted to preach as a senior pastor in a church and lead as a senior pastor in a church, and your gift set is not that, you're not second rate. But I would encourage you this. Please don't try to do that. 
Try to be what God has created you to be. Think about it this way. When the farmer plants corn, what does he expect to harvest? You can, you can respond, or ask our church to actually respond. When he plants corn, what does he expect to harvest? When he plants beans, what does he expect, expect to harvest? When he plants nothing, what does he expect to harvest? A clear vision for your life and working on a clear focus of what God has called you to be will help you reap the harvest you want to reap. In other words, if you've been called to be a pastor in this room today, or you have a friend that's been called to be a pastor, then learn and train and become equipped at what it means to preach the gospel and work as the main leader in the church. If you have not been called to be that, then be the best absolute associate pastor that you can be in support of the pastor of your church. Sitting back and saying, well, I wish my pastor would. Well, I think I know better because I learned in seminary from my professor that it's this way and my pastor doesn't know what he's doing. We'll never get you the harvest because God cannot honor that. It's the hardworking farmer that receives his share and a clear vision, a clear focus on what God's called you to be will help you be the best at that. You will reap what you sow. You will reap what you sow. And now is a great time to begin to sow the character traits as a seminary student to equip you to reap when you are planted on the mission field or in that seminary in the future or in that college education environment or in the local church, the body of Christ. Now is the time to reap, to sow so that you will reap later. And the farmer knows exactly if I work hard at the right things, I will reap the right things results. There's one lesson that I've learned about being a senior pastor, and Dr. Kelly referred. I didn't have any senior pastor experience before coming to Calvary, which basically means I didn't know what I was doing. But there's one thing that I did learn is the value of everyone around me. And that brings me to the third point. Because if we focus on the right things, we will get the right result. But the third lesson that I would learn from the farmer is on leadership development. Leadership development. We have to have a strong work ethic, a clear focus on what we're trying to accomplish, what we've been gifted to do and the vision that God's given us, but also the power of leadership development. Leadership development is twofold. There has to be personal leadership development. A farmer has to know what to sow and how to do it. Jamie told me in farming, that what he does is actually at the end of the harvest, once he's received the, the count, he knows exactly how many of the 35,000 seeds, talk about tedious, how many of the 35,000 seeds did not survive. He knows. They actually do a crop count. They actually do a head count on the seeds. He knows if it didn't survive. He cares enough about the harvest that he knows how much he sowed and how much he reaped. He pays attention to all those details. And then in the end, he determines, do I want to do that again? In other words, church leaders, if it doesn't work, don't do it because you won't receive a harvest. That's leadership development. Personally learning what works, what you've been gifted at, what you can grow in and mature in, leadership development personally. But the next key is is valuable because as Jamie tells me about harvesting the crop, he tells me about his family. And everybody's involved. When he and his sons are out there working, his wives and his wife, wives, be careful on that one, we're not Mormon. His wife and his daughters will actually bring them breakfast, bring them lunch, and bring them dinner. They never leave the field while they're working. They never leave the field. They have a great support system. For us to be healthy in church revitalization, we have to have people around us that support us in doing what we do. And I just want to commend the staff team that's around me um, today as well. And I want to encourage that for you, not to brag on them, but to recognize leadership development is key. God will not give you any more of a harvest until we learn to work wisely with what we have. We cannot receive any more in our vats, if you will, in our storage bins until we learn to utilize what God has already given us. And part of the great reason of a healthy revitalization here in New Orleans is truly the work 
of leadership development. Myself learning to be trained. I actually entered after I was in chapel last year, talked with Dr. Tolbert. I realized I need more training, so I entered the D-Men program here. Even though I'm growing a church, even though I'm grateful for all the past training and past experiences, I want to get better leadership development. And likewise, pour that into the team around me, interns, staff members, lay people. Lay people can be your best friend, not your enemy. They're helping you achieve the clear focus. And what is the clear focus? What is the clear vision? Reaping the harvest, right? It's not about them. It's not about us and our feelings. It's about the mission. And the mission is the harvest. And when we develop leaders around us, people can help us and support us. We can be successful. Does the corn grow overnight? I love that plant because it's a picture of patience. And just like the harvest doesn't happen overnight, neither does God's work in your life happen immediately. You may not finish seminary and have a church of a thousand when you graduate, but patience is a great principle. That's a leadership development quality. We've seen in three years the Lord take us from 200 to, you know, running around 500 on a regular Sunday special events above that as we've seen, and it's pretty exciting, but it's taken patience and hard work like the farmer. The fourth characteristic is spiritual discipline. Now here's where I'll talk about your calling and your giftedness, spiritual discipline. You see, the farmer does not control the weather. He can control the soil. He can till the soil. He can work hard. He can control most of the environment except the weather. Now listen very closely, especially the younger generation of pastors like myself, leaders as myself, future missionaries, future leaders. I want you to grasp this. You can put out the slick website. You can be on Facebook and Twitter. You can be able to write the next book that is the greatest opportunity to get your name out there. You can speak on the circuit. You can do all of those things. But you cannot replace nor control the work of God. It is the work of God that ultimately brings the harvest. Just like the farmer cannot control the weather, we cannot control or manipulate the harvest without spiritual discipline. In other words, it's God's work. It is God's work that we toil, that we work at, that we have a vision for. It's God's work that we develop ourselves to do. But we pray for spiritual discipline. The discipline to stick with it when it's hard. To do the right things when it's difficult to do those. To have a calling to reap a harvest. And then once we have sowed into our lives a strong work ethic, a clear focus and vision, leadership development of those around us, spiritual disciplines, spending time with the Lord and His Word, personal private worship, but also trusting Him. Because see, the reality is in this season of life, for many of you, you can be here as a student, you can be reading the textbooks, and you should. You can be doing your translations, and you should. You should be giving forth the hard work ethic. But if you leave out the Lord in this process, then you are anemic in your ability to actually reap a harvest once you graduate from this place. And then you have to go back and reprogram yourself, not from what you have learned, but for the spiritual discipline of recognizing it is only the power of God, not our slick presentations, that changes a life. That's spiritual discipline. We have to sow that, and Paul's teaching Timothy that. And one final thing that I think is ultimately important, and I look at Calvary, and I look at what God has called us to do, and what God has called you and I to do together. One final characteristic to sow in order to reap is a love for the harvest. A love for the harvest. I remember hearing a story about Perry Noble. I've uh, been to one of his conferences. Some of you know Perry Noble. He's in South Carolina in the middle of a college town, the middle of nowhere. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, New String Church has popped up and they're reaching lots of people. And I remember going there one time going, wow, where did this come from? My grandparents actually have roots in Anderson, South Carolina, where Perry Noble's church is. And I asked my mom about it. I said, do you remember this church? No, there's nothing out there. Well, now there's this huge church out there with thousands of people being reached for Jesus. And I remember everybody now kind of going, Perry Noble, Perry Noble, Perry Noble speaking. Have you heard about Perry Noble? You heard about Perry Noble? But you never hear anybody talk about what Perry Noble did to build New Spring Church. Perry Noble started in his dorm room 
doing a Bible study with lost people. And he began to reach the lost, Dr. Tolbert. He began to preach the lost to the lost staff. That's what he did. And it wasn't about this huge harvest. He had a love for the harvest, but he's doing the work. And then all these years later, after doing the right things, having a clear vision, he has this big church. But he had a love for the harvest. Now, now let me clarify very quick, clearly what a love for the harvest is. It's people. Love for harvest is not the name, recognition, the reward, the book deals, the speaking circuit. A love for the harvest is people. In your church that you will go to, there will be people that will be difficult for you. Love them. There will be people on the mission field that do not understand why you are there. Love them. There are students, professors, that do not appreciate what you're trying to invest in their lives. Love them. Because a love for the harvest ultimately will bring a harvest. A harvest of souls and those who get it eventually, who are won over by your kindness and your mannerisms and your effectiveness through your example of your work ethic and your clear vision of where you're trying to take them in life and the spiritual discipline that you reveal and the leadership that you will invest in them as you get better, they get better. And as you love them and love the harvest, you will see people and lives changed. You see, the hardworking farmer People depend upon him. His income, his livelihood depends upon him. His family depends upon him. Listen very closely. His community actually depends upon him. And if you watched anything in the news lately, there are major players that are determining the values of commodities in the world today, namely China, Brazil, Argentina, and Spain. You see, the world depends upon the hard-working farmer. And as the Apostle Paul says in verse 7, Consider these things, and may the Lord give you wisdom and insight into all of them. That's my prayer for you as hard-working servants for Jesus Christ. For he said in his word in Luke chapter 10, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord that he would send workers into the harvest. God bless you. Thank you very much. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Tonight at 7 o'clock in this building, we'll be having a special presentation from our music uh, students on the story of worship. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for what you have given us when you called us, an opportunity to see you do something great an opportunity to find out what is in us as we pour out our lives. Give us the courage, the discipline to be everything we can be in your hands, that hardworking farmer who sees the fruit of the harvest. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.